Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam amma ba'da ahmadil fillah Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Hayyakum Allah Continuing on in our study of Usul al-Sitta, the six fundamentals by Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab rahimahullah ta'ala with the explanation of Shaykh uh, Zayd al-Madkhali, rahmatullahi alayhi, rahmatin wasiya. Uh, we reach the third foundation, al-asl al-thalith. Al-asl al-thalith, an min tamam al-ijtima' al-sam'i wa ta'a, liman ta'amara alayna walaw kana abdin habashir. So, the Shaykh then mentioned the third principle And he said, from the completion of unity is listening or hearing and obeying the one who has been granted authority over us, even if he is an Abyssinian slave. So, here, Sheikh Muhammad ibn al Wahhab rahimahullah ta'ala, he mentioned that this is the third principle. And he also pointed to the fact he said, from the completion of unity, uh, the second principle was uh, the importance of unifying on the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam according to the Madhab of the Salaf and not dividing. So the second principle, the second fundamental, had to do with unity. So here the Shaykh is mentioning that this is this third asl, this third uh, f fundamental principle is almost fur'in. It's almost a branch of the second principle. So he said, uh, he said, from the completion of unity, so we talked about unity now, what unity means, from the completion of that unity is hearing and obeying the one who's granted authority over us, even if he were an Abyssinian slave. And so Sheikh Zaid Rahmatullah he mentions, he says, that is because Allah the Blessed and Exalted commanded obedience to himself and he commanded obedience to his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam without any restriction or condition. As Allah the Exalted say, said, Ya ayyuhaladheena amanu, O you who believe, atiyya Allah wa atiyya rasul. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, or uh, the Shaykh mentioned, he said that, or emphasized that this point of obedience is a duty which is uh, necessitated from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fi Kitab al Kareem, O you who believe, obey Allah and obey the Messenger and those in authority over you. Surah Nisa, verse uh, 59. The Shaykh said, So he commanded with obedience to himself and obedience to his Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, unrestrictedly, uh, due to the infallibility of what has come from Allah, the Almighty and majestic and the sufficiency of what has come from the messengers of Allah alayhim afdal salatu wasalam. This means all the prophets alayhim afdal salatu wasalam. And he restricted obedience to the ruler of the Muslims from amongst those who have general sovereignty and those who have specific sovereignty to obedience to Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So the Shaykh is mentioning that the obedience to Allah and His Messenger is unrestricted. You know, there are no uh, conditions for that. Because it, this is, uh, Allah commands us, Obey Allah and obey His Messenger. That's unrestricted. You know, there's no contesting the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or contesting and arguing uh, with the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. However, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the other haq, the other right, which is to the Muslim authorities. Those authorities, uh, authority, 
the authority over you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says if we complete that ayah, that if you argue or you disagree over something, then return it to Allah and His Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, letting us know that the obedience to the Muslim ruler is in accordance with the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it is not obedience in sinfulness. So if the leader commands you to take interest, for example, you don't take you don't take interest because that is a sin. That is something Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's a major sin that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declares war on. There's no wudge or no discerning, no other way to really look at that. It's very clear prohibition. And uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, La ta'a fi ma'siyatillah. That there is no obedience in disobedience to Allah. So meaning that you cannot disobey Allah just because you need to please someone else. You, can, you cannot disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Something that's clear. We're not talking about something that's sunnah. We're not talking about other uh, uh, maratib of the ahkam, other levels of the ahkam, but we're talking about things which are clear prohibitions. For example, riba, you can't say, well, my mother doesn't feel it's healthy for me not to have a boyfriend. I need a boyfriend and we need to have relations. You can't say that, just even though you want to be obedient to your mother. She feels that this is a healthy environment. She's non-Muslim, or she could be Muslim. Unfortunately, the way the world, new world culture, new world order, and the decay in morality is spreading. So, the point is, is where does your obedience, your obedience in this lies in being obedient to Allah and His Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sunnah rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, those clear commands, of the prohibition of that. So you cannot obey la ta'a fi ma'asiyatillah. La ta'a ta makhluq fi ma'asiyatillah. There is no obedience to the creation at the expense of obedience to Allah. And also, that's another very important benefit of understanding that command, because this is what distinguishes Ahl Sunnah from the people of some of the Mubtadi'een, like Ahl Bid'ah from the uh, Khawarij and some of those other extremists, is that they say, hey, even in that one command, that nullifies the ta'a completely. That breaks the contract, the social agreement. This is how they think. They negate all obedience to that Muslim leader or whoever has that authority over you, they negate it all and entirely for one mistake or one sin that they command, but that's incorrect. That doesn't negate the ta'a in absolute, meaning in all the other affairs which are in accordance with the Book of Allah and the Sunnah, the Message of Allah. So, for example, if the leader says, uh, not just allows interest in the banks, but they say that you must, everyone, in order to participate in the society uh, and be uh, a contributing member, they need to take interest, for example. This is a, 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 an example, okay? And the people, a person of religion, strong religion, says, no, I'm not going to because that is obedience to a, a clear prohibition. You know, that's obedience to something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited. And there really isn't much uh, room for, for arguing that prohibition. Except for with someone's logic and someone's uh, opinion and, and things like this. Uh, or to totally decontextualize the, uh, the nasus. So, they would disobey that commandment of disobedience, but they would still remain under the authority of the imam. That's the point, is that it does not negate obedience in all other affairs, in all the affairs. It doesn't mean that, khalas, I no longer have to obey the ruler because he commanded me with this one act of disobedience. No, but instead, in that act of disobedience, you do not follow him. But in other, you still, that does not break the social, social contract, that still he is the leader of your Muslim society or of the Muslims in general, if we had a Khalifa or a one 
uh, Muslim ruler. Uh, but in in the case that of our scenario, most of the you know we have Muslim countries which have their own individual leaders. So it's very important for us to understand that and that differs between Ahlul Sunnah. That's you know the view of Ahlul Sunnah versus the view of Ahl Bid'ah. Ahl Bid'ah from the Takfiriyin groups like ISIS, Boko Haram, Al Shabab, Al Qaeda, and other groups, and pro and those who will come in the future, that they hold beliefs similar to this. They look for anything to negate the obedience to the rulers. In fact, you'll find, unfortunately, when you look at the comments of a lot of the general Muslims, that they're affected by that. They have such negative views of Muslim rulers that they feel that they're all uh, disbelievers. And this is a horrendous disease that is spread in the Ummah. And the reason I want to mention that is because the people operate by no du'abit. It's easy to take some off the, off the deen, or it's easy to declare someone a mubtadi'ah. That's easy. Anyone can say it on their tongue. Anyone can strive to discredit someone. And that comes with radud, and why we have to understand, we have to understand that these things have bawabit. They have criterion. They have shurut. They have conditions. They have mu'ana. They have those things which prohibit from making takfir, or making tabdir, or making tafsik. They have things that prohibit those uh, from declaring that on an individual. But if you have no ta'sis, you have no usul, you have no foundation to stand on, but you just, your foundation is what you read in, the, in, in many political science journals and what the latest think tank has, has mentioned about this issue and about this Muslim leader or the newspaper and all of these things you gather from this and then you declare takfir, that's not a ta'seel, that doesn't, it's ghayr mu'tabar, it doesn't have any weight or real substance except for, unfortunately, the spread of that opinion amongst the general people. But in fact, these are serious masail and serious issues. And every leader in every situation is a case-by-case -case, uh, situation. And those case-by-case -case situations, reserve that for ahl al not for your desires. And this is unfortunately what is widespread uh, and needed to be, we needed to make ishara, you know, make this point uh, about this, this, this particular disease, which is widespread. Uh, then Sheikh Zaid, he mentioned, he said, so he commanded with obedience to himself and the obedience to the messenger unrestrictedly. unrestrictedly. Uh, and after that, and after what we already mentioned, then he said, so the intended meaning of the people of general sovereignty is those who are in charge of the affairs of the Muslims, whether it be in all areas of the earth or in the majority of the areas of the earth or in a province from amongst the provinces of the earth. These ones are called rulers and they have general, authority, uh, general sovereignty. So obeying them in obedience to Allah, the mighty and majestic, and in obedience to his prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is from the most indispensable of obligations and from the most necessary of important affairs. This is because obedience to Allah and obedience to his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the ruler of the Muslims establishes the religion, causes security to prevail, and causes the country, the servants, and the roads to remain safe. It allows the people to complete their objectives and achieve, uh, and achieve their goals in the life of this world. And the goals of the people are numerous and variant. From amongst them is he whose goals, uh, goal is to endeavor rapidly in seeking knowledge and fiqh in the religion. So he is able to complete that and he is safe since Allah has appointed those who will safeguard his honor, his wealth, and his blood. And the roads will be safe for him. Even if he travels through the various areas, then he will be traveling them whilst he is safe. And there are from amongst the people those who strike the earth seeking sustenance and desiring wealth. There is no problem with this and no objection to the doer, as long as he takes care of the obligation of whatever is required from him in terms of the Sharia knowledge, so that he can establish whatever Allah has required from him in terms of aqidah and worship and mu'amalat or interaction and manners and dealings. And the and there are from amongst them and there are from amongst them. It is, as the poet said, everyone has an objective that he intends to reach. And the free person makes a higher achievement his objective. So the objective is to complete these actions of the religion and worldly life. 
and they cannot be completed in a correct manner except under the leadership of a Muslim leader whom Allah the Blessed and Exalted has appointed. So the servant becomes safe and the country is safe and the paths are safe and the affairs inevitably becomes easy. So the individuals of the society cannot establish this and the individuals of the Ummah cannot establish this. However, it can be established by the Muslim leader, his representatives, and his delegates. Because a Muslim leader can provide things you cannot provide as an individual. And so uh, another important point we have to look at, when we have these individuals who just declare all the Muslim rulers, they say they're not, there are no Muslim leaders, and they live in the UK, and they live in America under totally non-Islamic uh, non societies, okay? But they're easily making takfir of the leaders of, of Muslim lands for their sins and mistakes. We don't say there isn't sins, and we don't say there isn't mistakes. We don't say that there are, are major shortcomings in ruling by what Allah revealed in many of the countries. We, that's not what we're saying. And our job is not to defend mistakes and sins. That's impermissible. That's not the job. That's not what the Salaf meant by hearing and obeying. That's not what uh, the maqsood of Allah wa Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the commandments of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is not to defend the leader in sins. No. But it's not to rebel. And it's not to make takfir without the right to do so. And it's fulfilling his rights. Even if he has shortcomings in fulfilling your rights. Or he's oppressive. Or he's an oppressive wicked tyrant. But he's still in the fold of Islam. That is the, that is the issue at hand. However, many people will sit comfortably behind their keyboards in the land of non-Muslims. Making takfir of all the Muslim leaders. And... and uh, fighting in uh, attacking the du'a of Ahl Sunnah when they're teaching about these issues, saying you're a Wahhabi, you're def you're a, a, a Dai, or a, a, you're from your scholars are from the scholars of dollars, your scholars are from the scholars of of the of the hukam, of the leaders. All these kind of uh, ways of slandering and attacking Ahl Sunnah, which has been the case since. Ahl Sunnah has been around, that there's always been those who attack them. And the Prophet said, The Prophet said, There won't cease to be a group from my nation that continues to be on the truth until they meet Allah, you know, until the command of Allah is fulfilled. And they're on that. They're still strong on the Sunnah, the message of Allah. So Ahl Sunnah won't do, and they're going to be attacked. And uh, in another narration, the Prophet ﷺ said, لا يضرهم من خالفهم ولا من خضرهم حتى تكون مساء And no one will harm them who seeks to deceive them or goes against them until the hour is established. Doesn't mean people from Ahl Sunnah calling to the truth won't be killed or won't be attacked in their honor. Or won't, that's not what it means. But it means there will always be somebody. لا تزل طائفة من أمتي there, will, there won't cease to be a group from amongst them. And it could be one or two people in one particular period of time or in one nation. But, how, but however, mojud, ahla sunnah mojud. And they're going to keep pounding these principles regardless, willow kariyal kafirun, willow kariyal ahla bidah. Even if the disbelievers hate it, even if ahla bidah hates it, ahla sunnah mojud. And they're going to keep preaching and they're going to keep going forward, bi'idnillah ta'ala. Uh, another point, we have to listen. Listen to this hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ said, "Asmi wa ta'a la mari al Muslim fi ma yuhibu wa kariya, ma lam yu'miru bi ma'asiyatin. Fi ida umiru bi, fi ida umira bi ma'asiyatin, fala sam'a wa la ta'a." So the Prophet ﷺ said, uh, "Hearing uh, asmi wa ta'a la mari al Muslim fi ma yuhibu wa kariya, obey, hear and obey the Muslim ruler in that which you love." Those things which are in agreement with your desires and you're gaining benefit. And that which you hate and those things which you dislike. You have to obey them. Uh, as long as they don't command you to do a disobedience to Allah. And if they command you to do disobedience to Allah, then there's no hearing and obeying. And, as we mentioned, it refers to that command. It doesn't make nullify the ta'a in, in absolute to the leader. Likewise, the Prophet ﷺ said, that the one who asami'u ta'ala mari al-muslim 
ولو كان أكل مالك وضرب ظهرك وكما قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم. In another hadith, the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said, "What means here in obeying in the leader, the Muslim leader, even if he takes your wealth and he beats your back, meaning that if the Muslim leader has oppression." This is what your prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So I can only speak. We can only speak about what the Muslims believe. We can't speak about what other people and other nations believe. But this is Islam. It's not Wahhabism. It's not Salafism. Salaf. It's Salafia because Salafia is Islam. That's why. But it has nothing to do with that. This is some conspiracy to be obedient to the leaders. Or we put these hadith. These are the hadith in in, in, in Sahih Muslim. Kitab al Imara. Go back, you'll find I counted about 122 narrations. Okay, so they're there for us. The Prophet ﷺ said that hearing and obeying the Muslim leader, even if he eats your wealth, even if he takes your wealth and he beats your back, and that hurts. It hurts to be tormented, of course. And it hurts somebody takes your wealth. I'm going to want to fight about that. I need my wealth. I mean, I mean I'm not in love with wealth, but it's it's how I take care of my family. It's how I am able to teach. It's how I can buy my books. It's how I can take care of my loved ones. It's how I can do this, how I can do that. It's <laughs> So you're going to want to defend that. But the Prophet said, He said, He said, Hear and obey. So that means that even though you don't like what he's doing, even though he's doing oppression and it's evil what he's doing, he's taking your rights and that's your hawk and you're going to get it back, Yom Al-Tayama, but you don't rebel. And you don't make takfir of him for that. Because he still can be an oppressive Muslim leader. And it seems like people don't understand that. But all the stuff, go back to Imam al tahawi go back to Aqidat al tahawiyah go back to all those books. I could bring out right now Mujalladat from the Salaf, Mujalladat volumes. Go to Al Al Qai, Sunnah Al Khalal, Usul Al Tiqad Al Al Qai. Go back to. Um, Sun, uh, uh, Imam Ahmed. Go back to it. We could go to countless books. And we go to the books about hadith. Kathir, 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 Kathir. Many, many which show and illustrate this point. So it's very important that even if it's uh, an oppressive tyrant, tyrannical ruler, he still has that right of hearing and obey in as long as you're not hearing and obeying in the disobedience. But he's still, his authority is not removed. Illa an tara kufran bawahin. Unless there is open disbelief, which you have barham in Allah, that is clear that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you the clear command, and that's going to come from Ahl Iman. That's going to come from Ahl Al Ilm. The people of knowledge are going to make those judgments, and then they're going to look at the Masada and the Mufasid as far as all the other Messiah that, that come down to that issue of, of, of course, rebellion and other things like this. All, there's, there's a whole series of, of conditions that the scholars, if you believe that they're scholars of Islam, unless you want to just interpret and make your own tafsir, and you want to make your own shuruhat of the hadith, a hadith, you know, you're some wannabe mujtahid, la, that's not the way, that's not the way. And it's not the way to make ahkam and make pronouncements of takfir without the right to do so, and what the prerequisite ilm to do these things. And that even regards goes with the honor of the, the Muslim rulers. So it's very important that we din, that we gain knowledge of Islam and that we, we practice that knowledge and we have true fiqh fi deen. Man yaradullah bi khayran yifaqo fi deen. Whenever Allah wants good for a person, he gives them understanding of the deen. And illustrating that fiqh fi deen is, is hearing and obeying the Muslim ruler. Because that's what the Messenger of Allah ordered. That's what Allah ordered. And that's what the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ordered. And knowledge and ilm and fiqh fi deen is qala Allah wa qala Rasul. That's the, that's the asl right there. Is what Allah said and what the Messenger of said. That is the asl right there of what knowledge is. It's going back to the book of Allah and the son of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Not some takfiri shaykh. Not somebody who's making so many pronouncements of takfir and, ich, and from his ijtihad and from his ra'i and from his opinion and from his view and from his thought and from his intellect and from his philosophical background. Now, from his political stance, no. It comes from Kitabillah wa Sunnah Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So then the Shaykh mentioned, he said, the obligation upon the Muslims concerning the rulers. He said, so due to the importance of appointing leadership over the Muslims, 
It is obligatory upon the subjects to learn, uh, to listen, and to obey the one whom Allah has granted authority over their affair and goodness, and to be patient with them even if they transgress. It takes some, some. There's so many ahadith, and maybe if we get a chance, we'll read some of those ahadith in Sahih Muslim. Uh, and the subjects must supplicate for their guidance and correctness. This is from the Sabila Mu'minis, Sabila Salaf Asale, is that they made they supplicated for the ruler. They didn't uh, they weren't uh, scholars of the ulama, uh, scholars of the leaders and all these other uh, claims and uh, 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 statements that the people make to attack and belittle the scholars. But rather, subhanAllah, it just amazes me. Every time I have conversations with people, because the average Muslims, I find from all walks of life, from all the countries around the world, in the West, from Jordan, from I know people from everywhere, and subhanAllah, that the way the, the things in the people's hearts of the leaders, because they make the judgments not on any sharia dhawabit. They just look at the news and look at all these other reports, whether they're true or not, they accept them. And on top of that, Something, uh, disobedience and transgression can be very wide open. But that does not necessitate taking one out of the fold of Islam. That's the point. But it's so hard to articulate that to so many people. They, their hearts are sick with regards to the leaders. And they just can't grasp making supplication for someone who oppresses. And for the guidance, because that's the, the stability of the society. Is with the, the leader, with good leadership. And of course the mujtama. So again, the Sheikh said, uh, the one who's granted authority over their affairs and goodness and to be patient with them even if they transgress and the subjects must supplicate for their guidance and a correctness and they must perform jihad along with them in order to make the word of truth uppermost and to cooperate with them openly and in secret upon, the right, upon righteousness and piety. They must not spread their faults and they must arrive, they must strive to advise them in the manner of the Sharia which is to conceal their faults. And what is more beautiful than the supplication of the righteous for the Muslim leader? So Allah, the glorified and exalted, answers the supplication of the caller when he supplicates. Very important. Supplicate for the Muslim ruler. Oh Allah, please guide our leaders. Forgive them of their many sins and forgive us of our many sins. Guide them and bless them to lead us based on the book of Allah and the sunnah of the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And bless us all to cover our faults and to clean up our faults. And make Tawbah to you, Ya Rabbil Alameen. And some of the noble Imams, such as Imam Ahmed and Al Fudayl ibn Iyad, and their likes aspired to strive and supplicating for the Muslim leader to the extent that Imam Ahmed said, If I knew that I had a supplication that would be answered, I would make it for the ruler. That's very strong. That's a very strong statement. Was Imam Ahmed a scholar for dollar and all these other things? No, he's one of the great imams that the ummah, the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the ummah of Ahlul Sunnah, accepts as one of the four imams of the madhahib in fiqh. A great muhaddith, Muslim Imam Ahmed, and all those and all the books, Asul Sunnah, and all the books that he he produced, and all the ilm that he produced, and a madhab that follows means a, a huge group from the Ummah follows him and his fiqh and jurisprudence or at least is influenced by his Imam Abu Hanifa Imam uh, uh, Imam Shafi'i Imam Malik and Imam Ahmed those great A'imma so those are their statements about obeying the leader likewise Al-Fudayl ibn Iyad stated that he would not make a supplication for himself it if it were to be accepted, but he would make it for the ruler because that which Allah the mighty and majestic would rectify with the ruler from the issues and the affairs of the religion and the worldly life is of much greater and more abundant benefit than the person supplicating for himself. So that shows you the hikmah and the wisdom of the salaf. They thought about the leader because that would rectify things for everyone. But if you just supplicate for yourself that, you know, you hope that your wealth is increased and you hope that you a better Muslim, that'll, that'll have a, a very uh, a small effect, which is very important. It's your soul. But however, it won't affect others except for perhaps your family and, and others. But the rectification of the, the leader is what's going to help 
the whole society and perhaps the whole ummah. And as I have mentioned previously, obedience to the Muslim rulers in goodness, as was prescribed by the noble prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, in a statement, obedience is only in goodness, atta'afi uh, ma'roof. And whatever from uh, objectional affairs and acts of disobedience appears from the ruler or from his helpers or from the subjects must be remedied in conformity to the minhaj of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam remedied the affairs and the errors which appeared in the society, and that was during the first generation, which the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam testified for with unrestricted goodness, and whatever came after it is likewise. There is no escape from striving to remedy, and there is no escape from striving to establish the obligation of calling to Allah the mighty and majestic. However, it must be done within the boundaries of the statement of Allah the Almighty. Call to the way of your Lord with wisdom and good admonishment, and debate with them with that which is better. And it is not befitting that obedience to the rulers of the Muslims be done out in public. Uh... The author meant disobedience to the rulers of the uh, uh, disobedient to the rulers of the Muslims be done out in public. Whilst there is found in secrecy and privacy that which contradicts the public. Uh, so he says it is not befitting that obedience to the rulers of the Muslims be done out in public. Whilst there is found in secrecy and in privacy that which contradicts the public behavior. So, for example. They're obedient, but behind closed doors, they are uh, rebellious uh, and rebelling against the Muslim rulers' commands and so on and so forth. This is because the believer who is truthful in his iman and trustworthy in his bayah, his oath of allegiance, his outward behavior in interacting with Allah the Mighty and Majestic and in interacting with the servants of Allah is in agreement with his private behavior. So the one who interacts with goodness with his Lord and with the people outwardly whilst contradicting that in private, then he has resembled the hypocrites. So this is from the types of self-oppression. So when his outward behavior is upright and his private behavior is the same, then this is iman and truth and it is a sign of, per, uh, of uh, perfection. So it's very important to know and understand that, that we want to have consistent behavior and we want to follow the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that is hearing and obeying the Muslim ruler. Uh, Shaykh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab rahim Allah ta'ala said, So the Prophet sallallahu explained this principle with a universal and common explanation through every way from the types of explanation, both legislatively through the Sharia and by way of the divine decree, the Qadr. Uh, the Shaykh Zaid rahim Allah ta'ala said, there is no doubt about this, because Allah, the glorified and the exalted, commanded in his book, listening to and obeying the rulers of the Muslims. And in many of the prophetic ahadith, the noble prophet, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, incited following of this principle, and he was stern with regards to it, so that there would be no obscurity upon the ummah in any period and in any place, or in any time and any place. So the command was clear. It's clear from the book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this qa'i, uh, this asl. But the people seem to mystify it and be suspicious of it, even though it's right there in the book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So they'll always find a way around it. Well, that doesn't mean the contemporary leaders. I, I saw a, a very excellent lecture. I, I watched just part of it anyway. And it was very impressive from one of the du'at in the UK, may Allah bless him and preserve him. Or as, as several brothers doing maybe a, a short conference or a short uh, thing. And he was talking about the Muslim rulers. And I noticed in the comments so many people who are keyboard warriors who sit more than likely in the UK and other places in non-Muslim lands saying, Why are you Wahhabi Salafis defending the rulers? So these people, these keyboard warriors, are making takfir of all the rulers, again, without any knowledge, without the wabit. For them, it's just what they see. We don't like what the leader's doing here. We don't like what this country is doing here. This country is, is fighting this country, and this country is doing this and this and this, and they're making takfir of these things, according to their understanding, which is limited. It comes from fiqh fi deen. And these are ahkam shari'i. So we have to be careful. So the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, said, Listen and obey, even if a slave is given authority over you to the end of the hadith. 
And the Prophet وسلم, said, listen and obey. Even if he, even if he strikes your back and takes your wealth, as we mentioned in the hadith, uh, there are many other texts and all of them call to the actualization of this sound principle from the principles of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah. Since unity cannot be achieved in truth except by listening to and obeying the rulers of the Muslims and goodness. And so we will stop there and we'll continue on uh, in our next sitting with the rest of this uh, principle and we'll bring some of the evidences from uh, from the Sunnah, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then Sheikh Zaid, he begins to talk about the Khawarij. Who are the Khawarij? And why is that relevant to mention the Khawarij? And we'll talk about that the next time. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.